Let's take a quick look at Matthew Pryor, a poet and British diplomat of the early 18th century, an arch royalist, very much aligned with Charles II after the interregnum, after the British Civil War period, a, uh, a notably more uh, iconoclastic of morals and conventionality than Dryden and others of the early Restoration Age. His career overlaps with an extraordinary expansion of the popular press and uh, in English newspapers and books. More and more people are reading on a regular basis. More and more people are reading contemporary events on a regular basis. More and more people are expressing themselves with a new freedom that comes with the Restoration on a regular basis as opposed to the more oppressive uh, Puritan uh, absolute uh, government of the uh, of, uh, of the previous era of the interregnum. This gets him into some trouble at different points when the Tories fall from power in Parliament. Uh, Pryor is actually imprisoned for a uh, for a while. He is persecuted, and he does some significant writing while in prison. That's a fun thing to look at. But one thing I would like to just take a quick look at. And one of the things that I think captures something really quite special about this poet and this time is his very short four-line lyric, A True Maid. No, no, for my virginity, when I lose that, says Rose, I'll die. Behind the elms last night, cried Dick, Rose, were you not extremely sick? <laughs> Ooh, saucy. Uh, clearly this is having a little fun, uh, with moralism, uh, satirizing the kind of strict moralism that you might see in, oh, I don't know, uh, the figures of Cromwell's government, the Puritan figures of the interregnum, where very austere personal moral behavior was enforced. And the more uh, cavalier tradition would be kind of a looser, more fun tradition, where a emphasis on personal pleasure is uh, notable. The, uh, the assessment of human nature as partly animal nature is part of that. The idea that, well, you can't repress sexuality. You cannot repress human nature, the urge to merge, if you will. That prioritization of what this poet, and I think others of his ilk, would see as a true assessment of human nature. That we are sexual beings. We are not purely spiritual. We are not... Rep we, sh we are not meant to be repressed, that God in his infinite wisdom endowed us with uh, little uh, urges, little lusts, little moments of sensuality that perhaps we don't talk about in polite circles, but that are always there, bubbling under the surface. Uh, and, and at the same time, this poem shows a kind of satirizing of that polite tendency. The inability to admit that we are sexual beings, that we are a little lascivious from time to time. The, uh, the scolding of that scolding temperament satirizing and making fun of people who are so rigid and, you know, judgmental about your moral posture. And that, uh, that tendency of the poetry is coming out. Clearly in this, you have, well, the virgin comes out, Rose comes out and says, no, no, for my virginity, when I lose that, says Rose, I'll die. Oh my God, my virginity is so important to me. My moral posture is so important to me. My standards, my standards, oh my God, what do people think of me? Uh, yeah, okay. Think about that characterization of her. There are only two characters in this poem. One is a woman, one is a man. Very obviously coded 
uh, postures. And here she is being set up kind of as a uh, kind of for essentially lampooned. But you have to consider that uh, that characterization. I, I think it's fair to say from a more feminist perspective is that um, a, a, a sense of making fun of Rose, uh, in which case it would be slightly misogynist in tone. Like, oh, come on, Rose, you're such a whore and you know it. Whoa, uh, that's, a little bit, uh, that's a little bit harsh. Or you can look at it from the other side, is that, is this poem empowering women? Uh, if Rose is a particular kind of woman, of woman, maybe other kinds are more able to accept their sexuality, are more able to admit that, all right, you know, we like a little fun fun too. And uh, that emancipation is implied in this. The poem isn't really telling us one way or the other, but I think you can make an argument one way or the other. Uh, formally, it's also interesting to look at the way this is constructed. Uh, this is just four lines, four very short lines. Very, these are closed couplets, four lines, two and two. One, uh, each couplet is, uh, has a rhyme, even if to our modern ears the word virginity and die don't necessarily rhyme. In an older tradition of uh, British-speaking English, they came a lot closer, but maybe it's also supposed to be a little rough. Maybe it's not supposed to be automatically an easy rhyme. The halting rhythm also hints in that direction, the way that it's not quite smooth. You can't really pronounce this with a simple iambic pattern. Da, 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 da. You know, no, no, for my virginity, when I lose that, says Rose, I'll die. There's no way to fit that into a flow. It is choppy. There are smoother ways of saying that. The poem doesn't do that. It presents this as a kind of a rough choppiness, which I think is a bit of a callback to an earlier tradition, the earlier late Renaissance era of poetry, was a little bit more awkward with its diction, with its meter. The poetry of John Donne, let's say, who was no slouch in the, uh, the moralism department, but made a, a, a greater prioritization on things being just a little rough, just a little rough to remind you that this is earthly, it is not divine. And I think the, the roughness of it is at war with the other instinct to try and be smooth. Those closed couplets are also perfect. Uh, the simple rhymes that always end at the, uh, the end of the line uh, it's um, it, it it presents a a characteristic of the universe that is very uh, easy to know, that is very succinct, very discreet and compact, understandable. But that seems at war with itself, with the kind of choppiness that's going on here, and these slightly weird uh, 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 possibilities of the rhyme, or at least that first rhyme, Dick and Sick resolves that and brings you back into a very simple rhyme scheme. So there, there is this a complicated world that's hard to handle, or is this in a very, uh, very simple world? There's tension there. there there's uncertainty there. Um, the names, of course, also kind of notable. Something else that jumps out, Rose and Dick. Uh, we don't need to go into any great detail. I think we all understand what these <laughs> names are picked for. Uh, the Rose and Dick. Uh, it's obvious. We're not going to go into that. Uh, most of all in this poem, what you have to, what you have to appreciate, and that is probably its most apparent thing, is that by the time you get, uh, by the time you read it, you're sort of chuckling. It is good, naughty fun. 
Again, the kind of fun that you're not allowed to have under the Puritan rule of the Cromwell government. But now that things are back and the king is back and the king loves a good time, Charles II, good time Charlie, known for being a bit of a bon vivant, known for having a love of the simple pleasures of life and not wanting to be too fussy and complicated about things. Uh, good times are here again. The poem is expressing that. The poem is capturing that and offering it up to people. And the simplicity of the language spreads that. The simplicity of the language and the fun and automatically uh, graspable content of it uh, is universal. Pretty much everybody can get it. So you can disperse this to far and wide throughout the populace. And it's not written for just an elite. This is not written just for a very educated upper crust of society. This is written for everybody. Everybody who's ever felt a little naughty and everybody who might want to feel a little naughty from time to time but takes refuge in the reading so that they don't have to go out and do it theoretically, at least, of course. And here you can see so much of that age, so much of that period after the Restoration, after the, uh, the earnestness of the Puritan way of, uh, 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 of, way, way of life, this breathing freely for the first time in quite some time, this conscious effort to celebrate human life, and human urges, and a little bit of fun from time to time. Uh, there is an element in here that is simply pure joyousness. And this will get handled a little roughly. This instinct will get suppressed as we move further into the 18th century and we get further into the Enlightenment and people start saying, well, this is just a waste of time. Uh, the moralism will also tend to fade away in the Enlightenment, but so will that sense of fun is worth its own uh, use too. It does find some expression later on in uh, Jonathan Swift and, uh, and Moliere and uh, that universal human need to accept who we are and to understand who we are and that we can't have a real understanding of who we are unless we accept who we are. These are the puzzles that are getting worked out in the culture at this time in history. These are the puzzles that are exhuming this new voice in art, this new characteristic of culture that is uh, very reflective of a particular time and place. But as I think we can all see, it also speaks to us from very different times and very different places because we are all, and this is a radical concept as well, in any time, we are all human beings.